Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled School Earthquake Preparedness. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our co-presenters for today's podcast, Mr. Mark Benthian and Ms. Jill Barnes. Mr. Benthian is the Associate Director for Communication, Education, and Outreach for the Southern California Earthquake Center. Mr. Benthian has also authored and co-authored numerous publications on seismic safety and currently serves as the coordinator for the National Great Shakeout. Ms. Barnes is currently the Administrator of Emergency Services in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Ms. Barnes has previously served as a Public Information Officer and as a Police Officer. She has worked in education for 18 of her last 21 years, spending the remaining three years in a public safety sector. Again, it is my honor to present to you Mr. Mark Benthian and Ms. Jill Barnes. Thank you both for sharing your expertise with our audience today. So let's start by looking at school emergency management. Districts and schools should create a comprehensive, all-hazard emergency plan. These plans should involve the collaboration of community partners, your first responders, uh, community organizations such as volunteer organizations and others. Your emergency plan is going to be customized to your district, your school, and your campus because each of those things are unique situations. An emergency plan should remember to provide for the whole school community, and that includes people with disabilities and other special needs. It should also support the implementation of NIMS, which is the National Incident Management System, and it should use the four-phase framework. And those four phases are prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So prevention and mitigation means to identify all the potential hazards and vulnerabilities in your area and reduce the potential damage they can cause. And today we're going to be focusing, of course, on earthquakes. Now, you may be an area that, you know, has earthquakes, or you may be from some place that really hasn't experienced earthquakes. And there are parts of the country that have very uh, few earthquakes over the years, but most of the country can experience some level of earthquake hazard. And, of course, the West Coast is well known for earthquakes, California, Oregon, Washington. But Mid-America and the East Coast can also and have earthquakes and have had large earthquakes in the past. And, of course, Alaska is actually the state with the most number of earthquakes each year. Hawaii can have earthquakes as well. So it's important to know what your risk for earthquakes is and include that in your planning. It's also interesting that earthquakes on the West Coast may be the same size as an earthquake in mid-America, but will shake a much smaller area. Just It has to do with the type of ground in each area, but a magnitude 6 earthquake in California will shake a much smaller area than it will in the mid-America area. And as a result, you can have much more damage from a magnitude 6 just because of that. Also, though, buildings tend to be older and not built to the, as new as building codes on the East Coast and Central U.S. than in the West Coast. And so you may have more damage because of that as well. But there are ways to find out your school's earthquake risk and the hazards you'll face. A great place to go to is the U.S. Geological Survey at earthquake.usgs.gov. You can also reach out to your state geologist's office, your state or county or even city office of emergency management. They'll know what the earthquake risk is in your area. You can contact local university researchers, and also there are consulting geologists and geotechnical engineers who you can hire to help you identify the risk for your school and your district. So earthquakes bring what we call a variety pack of issues in terms of the hazards and the consequences. It's not just the damage that might happen at your school. It's the damage that might happen in your whole community around your school. For example, there could be a hazardous material release that affects your students because of the air uh, being contaminated in your community. There could be pipes that burst and, and, and landslides that block access to people coming to your school. That includes first responders 
neighbors. So you may have not just the damage at your school, but in your community that will have impacts on your school operations. And this also affects you know the whole region is a key aspect of what we, do, we deal with with earthquakes. And depending on your school, you might have different levels of damage. Newer buildings are going to likely be damaged less than older buildings, and you want to understand the type of buildings that your school has. If it's an older brick building or if it's a, a newer type of structure, uh, you're going to deal with earthquake damage at different levels. And this is also something that you can work with local engineers to understand the level of hazard for that you're building uh, the level of damage that you might expect. Part of this is because, you know, while schools are built to building codes like any other buildings, they're only built as good as the, the code at the time of their construction. So if your building was built many years ago, it will be built to a code, but an older code. And newer codes are better and result in better buildings. So an example in California of what has been done is, is that the big earthquake back in 1933 damaged a lot of schools, and as a result, schools in California have been built to higher structural standards and have had more thorough inspection procedures. But this isn't the case across the country. And also, some codes are required of public schools but not private or charter schools. So you want to take that into consideration as well. Another key factor is even if your building does well in the earthquake and does, is not damaged, the contents in your building will likely be thrown across rooms, fall, and can also be a, a significant source of injuries to your staff and students. And there are ways that you can secure things. So we're talking about bookshelves, ceiling tiles, contents you may have stored up on top of cabinets. All of these are potential projectiles that can be thrown across the room, not just fall, and that can be secured. There are a variety of different types of straps and ways to secure these both furniture as well as contents so that it won't fall. Of course, we have a lot of computers in the classrooms now. Those can be strapped down as well so that both that they won't be damaged and you won't have to recover those costs, but also that they won't cause injuries. So you don't want to stack things up above head level if you can avoid that. And if you do, you want to make sure they're secured. You don't want to block, of course, exit signs with objects as well. You also, it's important that you make sure that your fire extinguisher is in operating condition, but also that it's strapped to the wall so it does itself doesn't become a projectile. So we're also going to take a look at the preparedness aspect. Now the preparedness phase of emergency management is talking about collaborating with your community partners to develop plans and protocols to prepare for the possibility that the hazards, vulnerabilities, or emergencies, in this case an earthquake, will occur. You already have an emergency plan for your schools, I'm sure. So really when you're talking about altering those plans for an earthquake, you probably only need to tweak it a little bit. Here are some of the things that you're going to want to make sure that you take into consideration. You're going to want to make sure that you plan for incident command and hopefully you're already using incident command system and uh, you'll just have to make sure that you've got that in, in place for earthquakes as well. You'll want to make sure that you plan for drop, cover, and hold on and it's important that people in the field know what they're going to be doing because there is no warning time before an earthquake. You're not going to get a siren with an earthquake. You're not going to get an alarm bell. The first thing, your first indication is you're going to feel the shaking and you're going to have to be able to tell the students, drop, cover, hold on, and they'll do so. You're going to have to take into consideration evacuation. When we're talking about evacuation in an earthquake for a school, we mean evacuating the building, not the school premises. And we have to evacuate once the shaking stops because it's the building and the contents that may become the hazard. It could be a little bit of a sticky situation because doors tend to get jammed during earthquakes. Sometimes your exits and pathways are blocked, so you want to make sure you have your two ways out and things like that. Once everyone has evacuated the building, you're going to need to make plans for doing your own search and rescue and your own triage because remember with the infrastructure problems that Mark had mentioned, people may not be able to get to the school or your emergency responders may have bigger priorities than coming out to you anyway. So we really at the school level need to be prepared to go on our own and take care of our own needs. Also remember that with an earthquake, there's always a risk of aftershocks, so you really have to be mindful if you're going to be sending people back into a building to do search and rescue, is it safe for them to do so because of the possibility of aftershocks. Now, don't forget, you do have people with on your campuses with special needs. So with your, your uh, mobility issues and things like that, are these children and sometimes the adults, is everybody fully participating in the drills? Do you have the additional supplies that you may need? Do these uh, individuals have the ability to evacuate on their own, or do you need to assign someone to assist them? Do you have a plan to assist and shelter them? Some of these students are medically fragile. Are your search and rescue and first aid teams familiar with the 
special needs of some of your students. You want to practice all of your emergency drills regularly so the procedures become more familiar with them. I know a lot of schools do a fire drill every month, but consider also adding in drop, cover, and hold on drills probably maybe twice a year. And then you should probably be doing one where you're evacuating everybody and running through all of your teams annually because that really helps. So one way to have a drop, cover, hold on drill that is beyond just your own school is to participate in a great shakeout earthquake drill. This is a new series of drills that are happening across the country on the West Coast and the Central U.S. And really anyone in the country can participate. And you can go to shakeout.org slash regions to find out where an earthquake drill, a shakeout earthquake drill is happening near you. What this is, is an, it's an opportunity to have your drill along with your broader school community. And it's what we're practicing is drop, cover, and hold on. What the ShakeOut provides are a number of resources, including manuals for how to do a drop, cover, hold on earthquake drill for your school, but also posters and videos and uh, handouts and materials you can send home to your parents, a lot of resources to support having a drop, cover, hold on drill in your school. So there are a lot of things that you're going to need in your disaster supplies. And again, you may already have some of these on hand. It's not necessarily the case that you're going to need to, to have special things on hand for an earthquake. But think, but think about all of your disaster needs. So you're definitely going to have your emergency plan that we've already kind of talked about, the, sketching out the basics of that. You will need water. Uh, you'll need first aid supplies, and these should be separate from the ones in your health office or your nurse's office, something that's specific to your disaster supplies. You need search and rescue supplies, shelter supplies, because once you get those kids outside, you know, how are you going to keep them dry and, and in moderate temperature? Food, and then the disaster management supplies, and that can be just a couple of reams of paper and some Sharpies so that you can do the paperwork and the documenting that you need to do, because of course we're not going to be able to rely on our computer systems. You're going to need to house all of your disaster supplies in one place. One thing that we've done in my district is that we've gotten a bunch of cargo containers, like the shipping containers that you see on trains, and we put one at every single school. They're 40-foot containers. Some of the small schools have 20-foot containers, but we have some really big schools. You can lock them, and the nice thing about those is because it's not inside the building, we will still have access to those supplies during a disaster, even if a building does go down, we should still be able to, once we've gotten outside, still be able to access the, the all of the supplies. And you want to make sure that they're in an area that's away from any kind of potential hazard. The biggest thing is water. It's the most important item to consider when you're preparing for an emergency of any kind. You can get special 55-gallon water barrels. It will store the water for several years. You can treat it with a little bit of, of, of bleach. There are formulations, so count up the number of people that you have on hand. Multiply that by the amount of water that you feel that you need and start buying some water barrels and filling them up. In terms of first aid kits, you can buy big commercial first aid kits. Now be aware that in these first aid kits, some of them are not designed specifically with the needs of children in mind, so you may want to alter what's in there and also, again, be thinking about your kids with special needs. If you've got kids on G-tubes that need to be um, fed through the stomach, do you have the feeding supplies that they need? Things of, of that nature, uh, medication for particular children. Uh, also be aware that some of those supplies in the first aid kits are going to expire, so try to keep all those together so that you can pull out like maybe a, a Ziploc of those and replace that whole section of the first aid kit at once. Also, when you're buying those first aid kits, if you're buying them commercially, look and see if it says it's for a certain number of people, like we have some that says it's for 400 students. That does not mean it treats 400 injuries because we presume a 10% injury rate in disasters. So if you have a kit that says it's for 400 students, it may treat 40 injuries. So be aware of that as well. There's some other supplies that you might want to keep on hand in addition to your regular first aid kit. You'll want to have some smaller water bottles or pouches of water to flush wounds. Earthquakes kick up a lot of debris and dust, so you get a lot of uh, things in people's eyes. It also helps to flush out wounds. You'll want a lot of those Mylar blankets on hand. Those are nice. They really do keep people pretty toasty warm, and they take up hardly any space at all. You can also use regular blankets, and the advantage of regular blankets is you can use them as stretchers if you don't have enough stretchers to go around. Helps keep people warm and dry. You'll want to have on plenty of those non-latex exam gloves to protect against infection and disease. You might even want a double glove. And you'll want to have a little bit of fresh bleach that you can mix with water in a 10 to 1 ratio. 10, 10 parts water to one part bleach that you can use as a universal disinfectant. 
Make sure that you're maintaining those first aid kits. Make sure they're labeled wherever you're storing them, hopefully outside in your bin. They should be a clean, safe location where the temperature is fairly moderate. And make sure you're replacing your expired items immediately. Now we're going to look at the response phase. The response phase is all about what happens during the disaster in the immediate time of the disaster. So response includes working closely with your first responders and community partners to effectively contain and resolve an emergency in or around a school or campus. But remembering that in a large-scale disaster such as an earthquake, those first responders may not be available to us at the schools right away. So we're going to talk about why we encourage people and, and recommend that students and staff drop, cover, and hold on during an earthquake. And just also, you know, if you're outside, stay outside. And if you're inside, stay inside. People get injured moving from place to place in earthquakes because in a strong enough earthquake, the shaking will be so intense that you won't be able to walk and you may be being thrown down. The recommendation is to drop where you are before the earthquake drops you. Move, if you can, to something, you, if you're inside, to take cover under, but only if it's within a few feet or so from where you already are. You want to take cover under a sturdy desk or table. If you can't get there, get down low next to a wall if possible and cover your head with your arms. That's going to make you a smaller target for things being thrown across the room or falling and also protect your both your head and neck, but also as you're crouched over, you're protecting your torso, you're protecting your vulnerable organs. If you are under something, you also want to hold on to it. That's the last part of drop, cover, hold on. You want to hold on to it be, and be ready to move with it until the shaking stops. The reason why we, we recommend drop, cover, hold on is because buildings rarely will collapse in the U.S. Most people are going to be injured by the things falling inside buildings. So you want to get under something to be safe. We no longer recommend that everybody get in a doorway. If you can imagine a classroom full of children all trying to get in the same doorway, this is not going to work. So once the shaking has stopped, then you want to evacuate the building. Why are we evacuating the building? Because the building itself and the contents are the hazard to you. So we want to get everybody outside in a safe location that's been predetermined. So first, as soon as the shaking stops, you want to make sure that you've identified any injured students. You can just simply, if you're the classroom teacher, just ask, is everybody okay? If you have students that, that are not severely injured, evacuate them with you if you can. You want to make sure that before you evacuate, you've checked to make sure that you're, you have safe passage, you've got a clear exit route, assist your injured students outside with you, and then make sure that when you do go outside, you're reporting in to your assembly area, whoever's in charge, to make sure that you've accounted for any kids that you've had to leave behind or Say you had a student in the library or in, in the restroom, uh, anybody that you know was not in class with you. If you have a go kit, which a lot of our classrooms do, they've got a little backpack or we have buckets with the toilet lids, we have emergency supplies in, in those in a lot of our classrooms, take all that stuff outside with you because it increases your stock of emergency supplies. Search and rescue. You will be sending people inside buildings to do search and rescue if it's safe for them. So your teams are going to have to learn how to evaluate a building's safety to see, you know, if it's leaning, you're not going in. If it's missing a wall, you're not going in. If it's missing a roof, you're not going in. Basically, what I tell people is it's got to look like a building in order for you to go back in. You're looking for to search buildings that have minor damage. Possibly you'll send people in with moderate damage if they've been trained. Everybody who goes in is going to have to wear personal protective equipment. Helmets, gloves, two types of gloves actually, the non-latex gloves and work gloves over those. Masks and goggles. You're going to send them in with, with a lot of basic hand tools. Pry bars, wonderful things because they're going to pop open those doorways. Uh, bolt cutters to cut screens off of windows if you need a different way out. A basic saw, a couple of pliers. Our own safety as rescuers is paramount. You do not want to become a victim. If it's not safe to enter a building, you've got to stop, you've got to get help, or you've got to find another way to address the situation. If you do go inside, you want to make sure that you are doing a systematic search pattern. We usually do a right-hand search, which just is keeping the right shoulder to the wall all the way around. You will need to make sure that your search and rescue teams get specific search and rescue training to carry out these duties properly. Next, we're going to talk about recovery. Recovery is what happens after the disaster is over, and it's all about getting back to normal and to restore a healthy and safe learning environment following an emergency event. Things to think about at a school site. Is the school safe to return to? Can we open school? What needs to be fixed? Things like that.
So to sum up, we're going to review some action steps for what you can do to reduce risk for earthquakes for your school and your school community. First, you want to learn your earthquake risk and factor it into your safe school plan. You want to secure your furniture and contents to prevent damage and injuries. Then also determine if your buildings need any structural improvements and how you would proceed to improve your buildings. For actually looking at response, you need to know where your emergency supplies are located. You need to make sure that they're sufficient for your needs, that they're not expired, and that they're in a location that you can have access to during an actual disaster. Then you want to hold regular drop, cover, and hold on drills, perhaps with your fire drills, but at least twice per year, especially if you're in an active earthquake area. Have more of those drills to make sure that your students are prepared for when the earthquake happens. Then you want to also organize search and rescue supplies and provide trainings to your staff on how to access those supplies and how to use them. So that wraps things up. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have learned how to have a better plan for earthquakes for your school. Thank you for listening to our podcast today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge of school earthquake preparedness. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenters, Mark Benthian and Jill Barnes, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.